AMD's R9 3950X brought back some of the excitement that we felt from the original Intel i9-7980XE launch from a couple years ago. The 3950X is one of the best production CPUs we've ever worked with, but the fact that it manages to slim down the HEDT Threadripper feature set into an AM4 product is what makes it more affordable and promising for the targeted uses. You lose the excess of PCIe Gen 4 lanes granted by Threadripper and the higher memory capacity and quad channel support from Threadripper, but still get 16 relatively affordable cores as compared to CPUs of the past. This makes the 3950X excellent for single or dual GPU production builds like Adobe Premiere render and editing boxes, Blender 3D modeling machines, gaming and streaming machines, or compression and decompression workloads. Today we're doing a roughly $2,000 production PC build using the 3950X. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair Virtuoso RGB wireless gaming headset. The Corsair Virtuoso headset is comfort focused with a set of memory foam ear pads, headband, and lightweight construction. The Virtuoso wireless headphones use 50 millimeter drivers that range from 20 hertz to 40 kilohertz with a wireless connection that ranges up to 60 feet. Corsair also includes a detachable high quality microphone for voice comms. Learn more at the link in the description below. We're pretty happy with how this build came out. So first of all, it's all not that looks were really a consideration for us, but it does have a good look to it. It's all black and gray, which is kind of cool. And if you go with the X570 Unify instead of the Ace that we used, it'd be even more black and gray. So that works out well. But anyway, we did some research on common builds. We used to, for those of you who haven't been around forever, we used to do PC builds as our staple. It was basically the only hardware content we did before anything else. And that was all on the website. And we do a lot of what we dubbed cheap bastard builds, which were really low end. But we did some research more recently, though, and saw that the two most common PC build price ranges, based on all the data that is readily available on PC Part Picker, appears to be about $2,000 and about $1,000. And the $500 range is pretty common as well. But $1,500, and there's like a almost, not quite, but almost a no man's land between $1,000 and $2,000. So we decided to do our first build for the end of the year as a 3950X $2,000 actual workstation on a budget, in big air quotes there, two grand isn't cheap, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper than uh, a Threadripper build, which that two grand would be just the CPU. So that's what we're doing today. We don't do a lot of PC build videos because frankly, a lot of the comments on them are generally stupid. And that's because people always bicker about well, but I could find a cheaper motherboard, or I could find a cheaper power supply, or uh, whatever, mixing and matching parts, because there's millions of combinations of PC builds out there. So here's the deal with ours. What we've assembled is something that we have validated. It's actually good. And we've validated all the components in it. So we know the motherboard recommendations are good. A lot of the motherboards people choose for cheap lists will uh, often be kind of questionable. We know that the power supply choices are good and everything else in here works well because we've tested everything in the lab. So that's why we went with this list. We're confident in the parts and we're not just picking things that are uh, $20 cheaper than what we'd like to use because we know that what we'd like to use is good. And the target here, we're gonna provide some thermal data for this specific build. So you get some thermal over time charts. We have VRM thermal data, we have noise data, power testing if you wanna see the power consumption for the build. And we'll also link some alternative parts based on needs. So you can find links in the description below along with the article. And we'll have the alternate options there too because there's a few key areas like 10 gigabit ethernet inclusion where a production user might deviate a little bit more still from what we've built. And this is meant to be for people who are doing things like what we're doing. You work with Adobe Premiere a lot, you may work with Blender, you might work with gaming and streaming simultaneously, you could work with network attached editing, that's one of the other use cases we've accounted for here. And we've already checked things like the QVLs, the timings, the VRM quality, all that stuff, so this setup's good to go. So for this build, we're using our recently tested AMD R9 3950X. It is being cooled by the Arctic uh, Liquid Freezer 2. It's a 280 CLC that we've got on here. A lot of you have asked us to test this. We actually do have test data for it. We're not gonna talk about it today, but suffice to say it performed well in our comparative testing. We've got, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 coolers tested for AM4, and this was one of them. And it did actually do very well. The tiny VRM fan on it is probably the main feature people think about. It is totally pointless in this build. It provides no value. 
that doesn't mean it's bad. It, it does work. The VRM fan on that thing, it works. It cools down the VRMs. Yes, uh, that, that would mean that it's not quite a gimmick. But also, the VRM for the MSI Ace or the Unify or the Tai Chi Ultimate X470 boards, they're already good enough that you don't really need the extra help when considering we've got two rear exhaust fans here. We'll talk more about the case configuration later. But anyway, thought some people might be interested in that liquid freezer choice. And we're recommending the MSI Unify X570 motherboard for this officially, although we've used the Ace because we had it free to use right now. And the two motherboards are mostly the same, although the Unify is overall a bit better. It's a bit cheaper. It ditches the RGB LEDs. One thing to consider is that the Unify has 2.5G LAN, which is useful, but for people who work with a similar workflow to us, you'd probably rather have 10 gigabit Ethernet. And if you want 10 gigabit Ethernet, the best cheap 10 gigabit Ethernet that's included on a board would be still the ASRock X470 Taiji Ultimate. And that's what we'd recommend if you really need 10 gigabit Ethernet without buying a separate add-in card. You lose a few things. You lose PCIe Gen 4, but if you're not using Gen 4 SSDs, you're not doing things that are going to be storage intensive, then that's fine. That's a sacrifice that's not really relevant unless you're in those scenarios. And in those scenarios, you go X570 and then get a separate LAN card if you need it. But anyway, the only other downside to the X470 Tai Chi Ultimate is that the ASRock BIOS is worse than MSI's. MSI has probably one of the best BIOS builds for AM4 right now, for Ryzen right now. Either way, 10 gigabit Ethernet is useful for anyone doing media creation where you have a network attached storage device locally. Obviously, internet speeds are not fast enough in pretty much all of the world to make any use of greater than one gigabit Ethernet, but that's not what it's there for. It's there for internal use. Separately, the uh, Tai Chi Ultimate VRM is sufficient for the 3950X stock or overclocked. You'll run into memory overclocking issues. It's T-topology memory layout for the Tai Chi Ultimate. It's not the easiest thing in the world to work with for memory overclocking, so if you're interested in that, then don't buy that board. But uh, CUDA acceleration is the next thing that's important to consider. In a rendering box, CUDA acceleration gets used in Adobe Premiere, gets used in Blender, it gets used in a lot of applications that are professional workloads. So we're using an RTX 2080 Super for this. It's a less prohibitively expensive GPU. We wanted to use a 2080 Ti, but at some point you're just picking the most expensive things, calling it a PC build, and we didn't really want to do that. So we made a compromise, like anyone with an actual budget of two grand would have to do, and we used the 20, 2080 Super. The reasoning for this, it's still expensive at over $700, clearly, but it's not as bad as $1,200, $1,300, 2080 Ti. And with Adobe Premiere, GeForce GPUs really only offer so much benefit once you get past CUDA, period. So 2080 to 2080 Ti, in the workloads we've tested, there's no difference. It, the CUDA acceleration it provides the same value for either card in our Adobe Premiere tests. I'm not sure if that scales to everything possible ever in Adobe Premiere, but it does for the things that we do in-house for YouTube. So this allows us to get by by going down a skew. You still lose some of that benefit in Blender. Blender can utilize the 2080 Ti fully. It will produce a difference in render time requirement with a 2080 Ti, but the build is overall balanced and you can leverage both the CPU and the GPU simultaneously in Blender, and the combination we've chosen here will do very well for you. So this is what we put together at the 2000 probably $2,200-ish price point, depending on what deals are still live when this goes up. We'll go through some data in a moment, too, for tests that we've done with this, but a few things to point out immediately. Layout, so this is a Fantex P400A. This got our best overall award. We used the non-digital version for this. Talk about that more in a moment. But layout, we did two fans in the back, both exhaust, and then we've got the two fans in the front intake for the 280 CLC. You do lose the hard drive cage, uh, which we'll talk about momentarily. But overall, it's a, a very compact, super high airflow case and configuration with the fans we've used and the placements they're in. And so thermally, this is probably one of the best possible configurations you could do in a box of this size and stature. Let's get into the numbers that we've collected, and we'll talk conclusions about what we might have changed now that we've gone through this process. For the case, we're using our best overall winner, the Fantax P400A, for its excellent airflow. We're using the non-digital version, though, of the P400A, as it'll save about $20, and we already have fans included with the Arctic Freezer, so the digital's extra fans would just end up mostly unused. One important note here, the Arctic Freezer just barely fits in the front of the case. You'll want to orient the tubes down to ensure that, as the cooler ages, air bubbles don't collect near the barbs. This is standard procedure for all CLCs. 
but in order to get the freezer to fit at all, you'll have to remove the hard drive cage and the cover above it. It does fit though, just all the more reason to use network attached storage for your editing machine if possible. If you do want to use the hard drive cage though, or just don't want to deal with this fitment challenge, then the alternatives would be either a different case, and you can check our best cases of 2019 guide for more of those, or a different cooler, obviously, would be the other alternative, like a 240 CLC or something, or an air cooler. As for how this exact hardware performs for thermals, we ran it using our standardized thermal benchmarks with a heavy CPU and GPU torture workload. This is the testing approach we use mostly for case testing with some modifications. The data obviously shouldn't be compared since all of the components are different, but it's still useful for determining how this configuration runs when it comes to thermals. We set the pump and radiator fans to 100% speed, at which speed the CLC only would measure 41 dBA at 20 inch distance. That's not counting the GPU or case fans or any other fans, mind you. We'll talk about total system noise in a moment, but the GPU is configured to run auto, seeing as that's how most users would likely run it. If we were doing a comparative benchmark, we'd control the GPU fan speeds as well, but they should be allowed to run in the most realistic user scenario for a one-off build like this. The CPU die temperature ended up at about 61 degrees Celsius at steady state, fluctuating only based upon load changes. This isn't a delta T over ambient reading, just a straight T die reading as measured at the CPU. Ambient was about 21 to 22 degrees Celsius throughout this test. 61 degrees is good, and as a reminder, you'll see frequency scaling from Precision Boost 2 for about every five to seven degrees Celsius. We actually, we have a chart for this that comes from our live stream testing where we showed how the frequency scales against cold temperatures starting with normal above ambient temperatures and scaling all the way down into the negatives. Anyway, back to the other chart. This is excellent performance overall, afforded by a combination of the case and the cooler. The RTX 2080 Super GPU has a temperature target of about 67 to 68 degrees Celsius, which is where EVGA configures almost all of its thermal targets for its 20 series cards. The fan spins at about 1600 RPM to maintain this. On a separate chart, we can also show VRM thermals. This is measured with our X570 ACE, so the numbers will be a little bit different with the Unify or the Taichi Ultimate, but they're all going to be close enough and will be well within reason, given one, their VRM quality, and two, the amount of airflow we have in this case. VRM thermals will be a bit lower from the added fan on the Arctic freezer as well, although its presence is entirely unnecessary for this build and board. It's, it's just an extra, it's bordering on gimmicky, but, Tactically, it does something. We'll talk more about how effective that fan is or isn't in our cooler roundup later, though. For now, we can see that the hottest of the two measured VRM MOSFETs peaks at 60 degrees Celsius, which is way within spec. We're not even close to thermal issues in this scenario at all. The 3950X has no problems on this board in the stock configuration and wouldn't when overclocked either. That's the same for the Unify and the uh, X470 Tai Chi Ultimate as well. There's plenty of airflow to go around with our fan arrangement, and we ended up with, as stated earlier, one fan in the back as rear exhaust, one on the top as rear exhaust, and then the two front intake fans for the CLC. We won't bother with a chart for this one since there's just one number, but with the case fan set to 100% speeds alongside the cooler fans, but with the GPU fan running at 54%, we measured noise levels at about 42.8 dBA at a 20 inch distance, which is our standard distance for measurement. Given just how much cooling we've demonstrated and how much thermal headroom is available in the CPU in particular, we could easily reduce noise levels by bringing the fan speeds down to, for instance, 80% while still retaining very good thermal performance. So you've got a lot of room here. This is the benefit of a thermally focused case with a lot of airflow. You can bring down the noise levels just by reducing fan speed and still have good performance, whereas a more quiet focused build would require higher fan speeds to overcome its own quieting uh, focus. So that's the benefit with the P400A. We should take a look at power numbers as well. We're using an EVGA Supernova 850G5 for this build as listed below. It was available for around or under $70 at time of assembly. The power consumption under load is represented on this chart. This is at the wall, so we can better see how much power the total system uses. With a CPU only workload, for example, we measured total system power consumption at 206 watts. That counts things like the, the fans and the cooler, idle GPU power, and the drives. A mixed workload with gaming landed us at around 370 watts total for Civ 6 and Total War benchmarks, with single threaded loads down at about 107 watts. 850 watts then for the power supply is way overkill, and you'd be fine with lower wattage for this configuration. For a workload that properly pegs the CPU cores and the GPU simultaneously to 100% each, which is very uncommon, 
you'd be at more power. So we could allow for some additional headroom as buffer if, for example, you're running Blender with the GPU and the CPU both working. But 600 watts for power supply should still be more than enough while allowing room for a little bit of future expansion, although not a ton. We'll link an alternative to the 850 watt unit just in case because 850 is definitely overkill. But the price for it at the time we were looking around was so good that it seemed fine because you could always pull it forward to another system in the future. We went with 32 gigabytes of Trident Z Neo memory. Since this is targeted at production workloads for the build, internally we have to use 64 gigabytes for our own rendering machines, as we'll frequently exceed the 32 gigabyte cap when rendering bigger project files. So 64 really becomes necessary for some workloads. If your work is similar to ours, you may want to consider doubling the memory capacity. Just obviously make sure you stick to a four sticks maximum for the AM4 platform. We wanted to pick memory that actually had good timings or at least as good as reasonable given current pricing. Remember just buying 3600 megahertz can actually be a lot worse if you than 3200, for example, if you buy one of the slower kits out there. Or if you don't check the QBL, the qualified vendor list, for the motherboard and the motherboard might just have bad auto timings. Our selection is 3600 megahertz at 1619, 1939, which is fine. It's tunable to tighter timings if you have some patience. It's certainly better than some of the alternatives out there that start at 18 or even go into the 20s for, the, uh, for some of the primary timings. But make sure to set Infinity Fabric as well to a one-to-one -one ratio. So that'd be 1800 megahertz here. If you're unfamiliar with the 3950X, we can recap some of the quick numbers from our reviews for other baseline performance. And back to the memory, if you need specific help on that, check our AMD Ryzen 3000 memory benchmarks, where we talk about how to configure it for the best performance versus when you get into diminishing or even negative returns. So some recaps from our review. If you don't know the 3950X, it does really well in most of the production workloads we test. With our Adobe Premiere 1080p 60 render of a convention video, the 3950X stock CPU was slightly outperforming the Intel 7980XE, and it was equal to the 10980XE. The 3970X remarkably did hold the lead over the 3950X, and it's remarkable because the Threadripper family has traditionally been worse in Premiere than AM4 Desktop, but it was 14% render time reduction for the 3970X. That's noteworthy, and it is good, but the 3950X saves you a lot of money, and it's probably the better choice for a lot of people who aren't too serious about max and out performance given the massive price jump for the 3970X. The 4K60 Premiere render finished between 7960X performance and 3900X performance for the 3950X CPU that we're using in this build. Overclocking the CPU is not particularly worth it in Premiere as the render time reduction is only about 3.7%. Blender's had a lot of recent updates lately and we'll show maybe some of the news recaps for some of those on the screen but they're really good for this specific build. Blender makes it easy now to simultaneously leverage the CPU and the GPU for rendering, so you can set the 2080 Super in this instance to crunch through its own tiles in conjunction with those that the 3950X is working on. The tile size is typically best at about 16 by 16 on CPUs with larger size sizes like 256 by 256 better on the GPUs. So this will be a consideration in your setup and you need to pay attention to software as well as the hardware. Other improvements include enablement of RTX hardware for rendering. This is new with Blender. So those extra RT cores won't sit around doing nothing while the FP32 cores do work. They'll join in too. To recap the CPU's performance, we're looking at just a 3950X workload. So the GPU is not helping here. The CPU was one of the best that we had seen for our GN logo render this year. Tile-based renderers tend to scale fairly linearly with cores, so this makes sense. The 3950X took 12.2 minutes to render our logo, whereas the 10980XE stock CPU required 14 minutes, and the 3970X required 6.4 minutes. There's a 48% render time reduction with the 3970X, but the price difference likely puts it out of budget for most people interested in this build. Adobe Photoshop is one of the 3950X's weakest workloads, but it still does comparatively well. The 3950X roughly ties with the 9900KS in this testing. If you only do Photoshop and nothing else, the 9900K is a better value proposition. But the 3950X outperforms it in pretty much every other production workload we tested, often by a lot. This comes down to Photoshop's reliance on single threads and on frequency, which benefit the Intel chips at the moment. One last quick workload recap, if you did miss those reviews earlier. Our compression and decompression testing made the 3950X look pretty damn good. For decompression, we measured the 3950X at 186,000 MIPS, allowing it to outperform the 18 core 4.5 GHz overclocks at 9980XE by 13%. So things to consider changing if you're doing a build like this. First of all, again, 
Looks aren't really our thing, but personally speaking, this is entirely subjective. Personally speaking, I do really like how it came out to be all black and gray everything. And I'd probably turn off the RGB LEDs in the RAM or get different RAM or something to fit that theme further. But just, again, personally, I like that look a lot. I, kind of like a monochrome or black and white style. Looks really good. But more objectively, things to consider would be potentially a different case. This is tight to work in. It worked out really well, but you want the tubes oriented at the bottom. You also, with a 280 in this case, it's unfortunate. It's pushing right against the I.O. on the top. And we've got about two millimeters of clearance right now, and it's so close to fitting without having to take the hard drive cages out. It's, it's just kind of unfortunate that that's the route we had to go. But if you're not going to use the extra space afforded by a hard drive cage, then you can still work with the box. It's just, yeah, you're going to be limited on the drives, but for network attached storage, it's fine. The alternatives would be a different cooler. Another alternative would be a different case. So the Lian Li O11XL is a much larger version of the O11 Dynamic. We like both of them. Both would give you more space to work with in this case, but they're more expensive. The O11XL is something like $200 these days. So O11 Dynamic non-XL would be a good one to look at. It's about 100 bucks on average, and we like that case for what it does. Uh, you would need to buy some fans with it, though. And then also consider the X470 Tai Chi Ultimate for 10 gigabit Ethernet, or alternatively, the X570 Unify plus the 10 gigabit Ethernet card would be the alternative. The Ace is honestly, it's on a bit of a sale right now, which makes it actually kind of worth it. But when it's not on sale, the Unify is cheaper. You should just buy that instead. We just used it because it was available to build with, and uh, we didn't have to, to go find a Unify somewhere. So performance, really good on this machine. It's one I'd be pretty happy to work with for our own production workloads. It rips through all of the rendering tasks, no problem. 3D animation and, and rendering there as well, no problem. Tile-based stuff works really well, of course, with the 3950X. You have a bit of overclocking headroom. The boards we've listed are all good enough for that feature set. ASRock has a bit of a lacking BIOS, but otherwise is OK. And cooling and thermals worked out well, too, because in our thermal testing, there's so much just headroom where you can allow the CPU or the GPU to get a little bit hotter and bring down the fan speeds. And then you have a quieter box that still performs thermally superior to most, most other cases on the market with the same configuration. So very happy with how that turned out. And that'll be it for this one. Links in the description below as discussed previously. If you want more data-centric stuff, uh, so we've got some data in here more than most PC builds probably, but if you want more still, check out our 3950X review if you'd like to understand better why we chose this processor. We've got a 2080 Super review as well. It wasn't our favorite card, but now that the 1080 Ti is basically dead, it's completely fine. It was just boring at launch, but as a product, it's good. And this is, just to conclude here, a build that if we didn't need these parts for further testing for reviews, I'd pull this right now and use it as one of our production machines. Very happy with the performance. It's one of the best possible configurations that we could build with the parts we have on hand. Yeah, you could do a 2080 Ti, but for Adobe Premiere, for what we do, it stops mattering. And yes, we could do a 30, uh, 3970X, but again, just the value of the 3950X is insane. And in our testing, we objectively show why it's so damn good. So you check the review for more of that, but anyway. Pretty happy with this one. Check back for more. Subscribe as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. We've got the end of our sale on there. If you go to check out and type in Black Friday in the checkout cart up until December 4th, it will give you 15% off of any order. And you go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out there as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.